You can stand and take your psalm books, page 191. We're going to do all four verses. There's power in the blood, page 191. Oh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's type. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Jimmy Galloway, you pray for us, brother. Amen. All right, you can be seated. And uh, Good evening. Certainly good to see each of you here this evening for our midweek service. And I uh, trust that you're doing well. And looking forward to our Bible study, Hebrews chapter 11, this evening. Let me make a couple of announcements and we'll uh, get on into our song service. Uh, Sunday, many of you have asked me what our plans are for Sunday. Uh, I'll send out an email or a text message with a link to our website. Uh, before the end of the week, but uh, as of right now, uh, this coming Sunday, we will go back to two worship services, uh, one at 11 and one at 6 p.m. for everybody. Uh, no Sunday school at 10. We'll hold off on Sunday school for another week or two just due to the fact that between Sunday school and worship, there's that's when most fellowshipping and handshaking and contact would take place, and so uh, no Sunday school for another week or two, but we will have worship Sunday morning at 11 o'clock for everyone, not two, sun, not two morning services, but 11 o'clock and 6 p.m., and so those services are for everyone, and I look forward to being back together uh, with everyone collectively. I know Sunday was uh, a little bit odd and different, but worked out well, and I appreciate your cooperation in that. Now, uh, let me just say this. I have, uh, uh, I say I, we as a church, uh, or our decisions uh, have been criticized by some, and I know a lot of people maybe didn't understand why we did cancel services uh, in person for the length of time that we did. Listen, it has nothing to do with being afraid of the government, uh, I promise. 
Uh, if the government would have told us to shut the doors, they didn't, by the way. If they would have, we would have flung them wide open. Uh, but uh, in collectively and, and in accordance to Romans chapter uh, number 13, Mark chapter 12, places like that, we just felt that it was best to uh, go to an online format. I uh, just want to answer some questions that have been given. Listen, two, a twofold reason for that. Number one, safety and health of our people. If someone would have contracted this and passed away, I don't know that we would have forgiven ourselves and I would have been the one doing that funeral. And, uh, and so I, I didn't want to put anyone in harm's way that way. And number two, to protect our testimony to a lost world around us so that when things do open up as they are and when things get back to normal so we can keep a good testimony in our community and reach, reach uh, this part of Houston for Christ as best as we can. And, uh, and so I, I just, just wanted to clear those things up and let everyone know, but I am so glad that things are opening up and we can get back to worshiping uh, as the body of Christ corporately uh, together. And I know that you are as well, and rightfully so. Uh, as far as announcements go, uh, ladies, your, uh, the ladies' banquet uh, is June the 27th. That's still a while out, but uh, we want, want you to be aware of that so you can make plans uh, for that. And, uh, and so keep that in mind. We won't have Wednesday night supper for a few more weeks at least, and uh, so keep those things in mind. Um, as far as any other announcements, I can't think of any at this time, but I uh, did want you to make you aware about Sunday. We will have two, uh, uh, two worship services Sunday, one Sunday morning, one Sunday night like normal. The only thing is no Sunday school at 10 o'clock, so we'll start at 11 on Sunday. So keep these things in mind. All right, Brother Ken, let's sing some more. To have your books over page 190. Do all four verses of page number 190. <clears throat> have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each Moment in the crucified, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansed blood of the Lamb? Are your garments Spotless are they white as snow, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, oh be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? All right, thank you, Brother Ken, Miss Joni, Miss Shar. Let's take some prayer requests this evening, and then we'll get into our midweek Bible study. So if you've got any prayer requests, just raise your hand, and, and uh, 
I'll call on you from here. Miss Cecilia. Okay, Piper's a little girl, Miss Cecilia Keeps, and uh, her, not Keeps, but uh, watches and works with uh, as a nurse. Uh, okay, Piper Keeps, Miss Cecilia, okay. Uh, any others? Brother Richard? Okay, let's continue to pray for Miss Eva, certainly. Miss Joni? Thank you, Miss Joni. Uh, I had a great uncle in Minnesota. It was Dan Karen, my grandfather, who's been here on a few occasions, played the harmonica. It's his younger brother. He passed away uh, a few days back. And really sad for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's lost. Uh, he, was, um, he was Lutheran, but not practicing in any way whatsoever, just for the sake of the name, I guess. But a good man morally, but he... He was lost. His mother, my great-grandmother, is still alive, and due to the COVID-19, that no one was able to see him in the hospital beforehand, and she lives in a retirement home. No one's ever been to get to her. They won't let anyone in to see her or comfort her, and so I wish you pray for my great-grandmother. Uh, she, uh, she is probably lost as well. Uh, she made a statement to me. I talked to her on the phone the other night and just told her I was praying for her, and she said, well, Wesley, she said, I got a lot of comfort. She said, the, the uh, nurse told me that the priest was with Dan all day, the day that he passed. And she said, it brings a lot of comfort to me. And so that really, really burdens me, makes me sad for her. They're trapped in religion. But you pray for her, Ruth Karen, my, my grandfather's mother. Uh, and then I talked to Miss Jan Phillips today. Uh, you pray for uh, her sister Joyce, of course. She asked prayers, but her Miss Joyce's husband, um, goes by Rich. Uh, many of you know him, Hobie, Hobie Richards. Uh, he's just found out he's got cancer as well. Thought it went to the hospital with some pain and he's got cancer. And so you pray for them as well. Uh, any others? Lee Bell. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lee. We need to. Ms. Kim. Okay, all right. It's Ms. Bob Miss Kim's niece, Courtney. Brother Tom. Okay, all right. Thank you, Brother Tom. Ms. Debbie. Okay, all right, sure. Robert. Okay, thank you, Brother Bob. I mean, Brother Robert. Andrew. Let's do this. Pray for David. Any others? All right. I don't see any hands. Uh, we won't gather around the altars this evening, but let's do go to the Lord in prayer and ask his, uh, his guidance in these areas, his hand to touch these areas, and then pray for our church. Lord, and I always appreciate your prayers for us as well. Uh, let's bow together and go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Anthony, would you pray for us tonight?
Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, you can uh, turn in your Bible to the book of Hebrews. Maybe you're already there, the 11th chapter. We'll continue our series uh, that we have been in for some time through the book of Hebrews. And, and we've been in Hebrews chapter 11 now for uh, five or six, seven weeks, something like that. And we'll be in here for some time, as you can imagine. You know that the book of Hebrews is all about, uh, you know, has a twofold purpose. Uh, number one, to let us know that Jesus is better. And then number two, to encourage Christians to go on, uh, to, to be all that God uh, would have you and I to be. And so uh, that's what we've seen so far. Now you get to Hebrews chapter number 11, and the chapter is all about faith. Uh, it's been titled, God's Hall of Fame of Faith. Um, and uh, rightfully so, because really it gives just a list of characters, uh, Old Testament saints of God, and gives us examples uh, of their great faith. The chapter starts out by describing what faith really is, and you'll notice in chapter 11, verse uh, number 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so it describes it for us, and then it jumps right into this character study. I defined faith for you, uh, and I have each week now since we've been in this chapter, as uh, trusting God in spite of consequences, uh, trusting God in spite of uh, the situation and what's going on uh, around us and, and acting upon what God says to do. Well, you get to chapter number 11, and, and we'll begin our reading this evening in verse number 22, and uh, it's about a very familiar Bible character. One of the greatest Bible characters in the Old Testament, one of the greatest saints in the Old Testament, Joseph. And notice the Bible says in Hebrews eleven twenty two, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Joseph's life uh, tells us that real faith will bring real joy in our lives. When you study his life, seemingly there is a discrepancy in the use of the word joy. You see, if anybody in the Bible, uh, any character in the Bible, uh, knew what trouble was, knew what heartache was, knew what trials and hard times were, no doubt Joseph was it. It had to be Joseph. In fact, when you look at his life, his life alone really disproves a whole lot of philosophy that you hear floated around today. For instance, worldly philosophy will tell you that, that if you're going to be successful, then you need to climb the ladder of success. And you do this by going up one step at a time until you reach success at the top. But when you look at Joseph's life, his life really slaps that theory right in the face, doesn't it? Because his way of success was not ascending a ladder, but really descending a ladder because it seemed like every step forward that he took, he took three or four backwards. Worldly philosophy says that if you're saved... Uh, a yellow brick road is your future, uh, that nothing bad's going to happen to you, and that if problems arise, and if sickness comes, and if things do go wrong in your life, then it has to be because of some sin in your life or something you've done wrong. Well, Joseph's life slaps that theory right in the face. Joseph's life seems to be one uh, trial, one test, one heartache, one problem after another. But, you know, when you have real faith in the real God as did Joseph, uh, we'll find out that you can have joy in the midst of those issues, in the midst of your problems. If anybody had a reason to be bitter about uh, the deck of cards that was given to him, it had to be Joseph. But if anybody uh, had that reason, it was him, but you'll find out he didn't. He didn't. He was not bitter. He was not hateful. He didn't seek revenge. He had real faith, and his real faith brought real joy in the midst of difficult situations. Just two points this evening. Notice with me, number one, what I'm simply calling Joseph's steadiness in joy. His steadfastness, you might say. And we're, keep in mind we're talking about faith and how faith brings joy. You know that Joseph was let down by those close to him and Joseph was badly mistreated by those that were against him. But none of these things kept him away from having joy in the Lord. Now, you can't study about the life of Joseph 
just in Hebrews chapter 11. You've got to go back to Genesis chapter 37, or that's where we'll go this evening. A few things here about his steadfastness uh, in joy. Uh, when you consider the, 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 the people and the ways that he was mistreated and forsaken, it really is amazing how steadfast he was in joy, how he was able to continue in the joy of the Lord. Number one, Joseph was forsaken by his family. He not only had trouble from without, Joseph had trouble from within. You know the story. Here's what got him in trouble with his family. Simply he told carnal people that he had some spiritual aspirations. People who are carnal and people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't understand the, the spiritual dreams and the spiritual aspirations in our lives. And as a matter of fact, according to 1 Peter chapter 4, I think it's verse number 4, they, people will think you're crazy because you live for God. Now I found out uh, a, a while back, I won't say a long time ago, but a while back, that if I didn't want to be criti criticized, if I don't want to be criticized, then... Don't tell anybody the plans and the dreams that you have uh, for the Lord's business. Uh, you know, when I first started preaching and I was, man, on fire for the Lord, I would, I would share with people the things that God had, had put in my heart. And I'm not talking about uh, whims of the flesh. I'm talking about real things that the Holy Spirit placed within my heart. And when I would, I would hear comments from friends like, you can't do that. Those things will never happen. You're going to waste a lot of try time trying to fulfill those things. And, and uh, if I had listened, in a lot of cases, to, to those people, maybe I wouldn't be where I'm at uh, today. But when you have a word from God, and you know that God's put something in your heart, a burden in your heart, and He gives you faith to believe in that, uh, friend, that may not be hypothetical. That's real. That's real. Now, the world doesn't understand that. The world's not going to understand that if you put your faith in God and you are right by Him, then God will do right by you. God will do right by you. The psalmist said, Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. And not only will He give you the desires, He'll put desire in your heart, but He'll put the right kind of desires within your heart. Joseph told his brothers his dreams. And from that moment forward, boy, it seems like there was a target on his back from his brothers, doesn't it? Joseph's father gave him a coat of many colors. You know the story. If you're in Genesis 37, notice verse number 3. It says that Jacob loved Joseph more than his all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, a lot of times we hear this preach that Jacob was partial to Joseph and maybe that is the case, but let me just say this in Jacob's defense. We need to read the Bible within the culture that it was written and uh, he's maybe not showing as much partiality within the family as we might think. In Eastern culture, there was always one son that would take the father's place when the father died and be the spiritual leader of the family. And that son would be identified by a special piece of garment. Uh, most of the time, it would have been the firstborn son, but not always. It didn't have to be. And uh, so Jacob favored this boy. He gave him the coat of many colors because he was to be the spiritual leader when he passed off the scene, uh, when Jacob was gone. And Brother Joseph's brothers hated that. They didn't like that one bit. My granddaddy used to tell me, son, there are three ways to avoid criticism. Have nothing, do nothing, and know nothing. Uh, friend, nobody will criticize you if you don't have anything. Nobody will criticize you if you don't do anything, and nobody will criticize you if you're dumb as a box of rocks. But the very moment that you do something, the very moment that you have something, the, the very moment that you know something, uh, they'll let you know it. They'll let you have it. They'll let you know that they aren't pleased with you, and most of the time it's because of jealousy. Joseph's brothers were filled with it. Were filled with it. There's an interesting verse in Song of Solomon, chapter number 8, verse number 6. You might jot it down. You know, it is a heart-wrenching thing to stand by the grave and watch as a loved one is buried. But listen to what this verse says. It says, Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Jealousy will tear up your family. Je jealousy will tear up a church. Jealousy will tear up a nation. From that day forward, Joseph was blessed. He was, he was favored by his father. And the day he shared his dreams with his brothers... They hated him. They despised him. They hated his guts. They threw him in a pit. You know the story. They sold him as a slave. They, then they lied about what happened. And you'll notice in, in uh, Genesis 37, 31, the Bible says, and they took Joseph's coat and 
killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in blood. They sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt rent in pieces. Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. I can take criticism and I can take opposition and I can take anger from a lot of people. But boy, I don't want it from my family. I don't want it from my family. Sometimes the people that you and I love the most will hurt us the most. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Sometimes the people you love the most will hurt you the most. I understand there are no such things as perfect marriages, and I know that there are no perfect families, and I know that there are no perfect children, and there are no perfect husbands, and no perfect wives, and there are no perfect churches, and I, I, I get all of that. All of us have imperfections in our lives. But boy, doesn't it hurt when you're forsaken by your family, when you're hurt by those that you love the most, when your own flesh and blood may turn against you, when you're despised when you're rejected when you're afflicted by the people that you love the most that hurts those things happen in the real world they happen in the real world joseph could have become bitter about these things because that's exactly what happened to him but he didn't his faith was able to kick in and his real faith gave him real joy even when he was forsaken by his family not only was he forsaken by his family he was framed by his foes you know the story, his brothers sold him to the Midianites. They in turn sold him to the Egyptians. That shepherd boy became a slave in the house of a ruler by the name of Potiphar. Uh, Potiphar's wife had a harlot spirit. She was flirtatious. And one day she, was, she cornered Joseph and asked him to commit adultery with her. Joseph told her, I can't do this. My master's been good to me. He trusts me. And he made this statement. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? You know the story. Joseph ran from her presence, but she grabbed his coat. Then she let out a scream. She framed him by lying and said that Joseph had tried to seduce her. Now, Joseph was completely innocent, but he was thrown into prison. You know, Joseph may have lost his coat, but he kept his character. He kept his character. Now, it was unfair, but life's not always fair. That's part of the real world. There will be times in our lives when you're going to suffer. There will be times when you'll be accused of things that you haven't done. There may be times when we'll have to pay for what maybe others have done, and Joseph was certainly doing that. He's paying for something that he didn't do. It was an unfair deal, but sometimes life can be tough. It can be raw. It can be unfair. I think when the guards slammed the prison door shut and those metal bars clanged together, I think Joseph knew what was in his heart. I think he knew that he had done nothing wrong. Friend, listen, whatever is falsely said against you, or whatever situation that you've been done wrong in, when you cut your light out at night and you lay your head down on your pillow, if there is a sweet communion between you and the Holy Spirit of God, you'll know the peace of God. You'll know the peace of God. And it won't matter what others have said because you'll know that you're right in the eyes of God. Joseph could have used this incident in his life to make him bitter, no doubt. He had every right in the world to, but... But his faith kicked in. And when his faith kicked in, he had joy, and his joy got him through being framed by his foes. He was forgotten by his friends. Even in prison, he made some friends. God blessed him by giving him favor with the baker and the butler. You know, they even told him, they said, Joseph, when we get out of here, we, we get back to our own jobs, we're going to remember you. Well, when the butler got back to his position, that just didn't happen. He was lied. He forgot about Joseph. And let me throw this in here. The only time you're going to serve God is when someone's handing out gold stars. You're not going to get much done. The only time you're going to serve God is when you're receiving rewards and pats on your back. You're not going to get a whole lot done for God. You won't last very long. The reason is humanity's real quick to forget. Your family will forget. Your friends will, will forget. Your enemies will forget. But friend, when those, have, those that have forgotten about you do forget about you, Rest assured, there's one that has never forgot about you. Joseph was forgotten by his family. He was framed by his foes. He was forsaken by his friends. Yet there's never a trace of bitterness in the Bible when you read about Joseph. There's never a verse where Joseph's trying to get revenge. We don't read about Joseph having any angry towards, to anger towards any of them. I think it's because his faith was real. 
His faith was real and his faith gave him a source of joy. His faith gave him a reservoir of peace that, that, world, uh, that, that the world or no one else could take away. And when you know God and when you're, when you're hooked up with God, the joy of the Lord really does become your strength, doesn't it? Real faith produces real joy. It's steadiness in joy. Notice with me, secondly, our final point this evening is source of joy. His source of joy. Certainly he was disappointed by how he was mistreated by others. That's human nature. But he still had a, a joy in the Lord, didn't he? What's the source of that? Well, we could simply say it's in the Lord, but let's go a step deeper. Joseph experienced God's uh, unlimited presence, and God's unlimited presence was a source of his joy. When you study his life, there's a phrase that just follows along chapter after chapter, verse after verse, and it says that everywhere Joseph went, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him when he was in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with him when he was in prison. And the Lord was with him when he finally got back to the palace. Everywhere he went, Joseph had God on his side. He was in him. He was with him. He was upon him. He experienced the unlimited presence of God. He found that God was with him on the backside of the desert. He found that God was with him when he's thrown in the pit. He found that God was with him at Potiphar's house, in the prison bars. And, and uh, he found that God was everywhere, everywhere. And everywhere he went, he experienced the joy of the unlimited presence of God. Friend, it doesn't matter how heavy the cross, how, how hot the battle. It, it doesn't matter how deep the dungeon is or how dark the night may get. When you have somebody walking with you, Boy, the day can get sweeter. I remember growing up, we grew up on about seven acres of land, and, and uh, sometimes late at night, uh, Daddy would, would want to go hog hunting or, or uh, something like that. Now, as a young boy, uh, five years old, six years old, being alone in the middle of the woods in pitch black darkness could get real scary. And uh, you would be pretty nervous every step. Uh, you'd hear things. Uh, you'd wonder who was in the woods about to get you, what was in the woods about to get you. But you notice as long, but you know, as long as daddy was with me, as long as my daddy was walking in front of me or walking beside my side, I, I didn't worry about those things. There was no nerves whatsoever because I knew as long as daddy was with me, nothing was going to happen. Nothing was going to happen. When, when God said, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world, uh, God meant what he said. God said it means that he is positively, without question, going to be with you. Now, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. I think that covers the pits. I think that covers the palaces. I think it covers the valleys and the wildernesses and the, the dry riverbeds and the, the, the nights when your heart is broken and you can't sleep and the days when everything is well and, and nothing could be better. Uh, friend, you and I cannot go anywhere God's not already been and you're not going to go anywhere where God's not already there. And when your family and when your friends and when your foes uh, and no one is there, God is. God is. Boy, that ought to bring a lot of joy to your heart. That ought to bring a lot of joy to your heart. Jacob told Joseph back earlier in Genesis 37, he said, go check on your brothers. Well, they saw him coming. You remember what they said? Behold, the dreamer cometh. They made fun of him. They made fun of him. They found an old dry well, and they took their young, innocent, pure brother, threw him into it. We can only imagine how lonely he must have been and how his heart must have ached being in there. I'm sure through the hole at the top, he could hear his brothers as they made fun of him as they talked about him, uh, this and that, as they laughed at him. But in the midst of that pit experience, I think somebody bigger than Judah, somebody bigger than Simeon, somebody bigger than Reuben, somebody bigger than any of his brothers, jumped down in that pit with him, put his arm around him and son, said, Son, they may not care about you, but I care about you. And son, they may not want anything to do with you, but I want something to do with you. And they may forsake you, but Joseph, I'll never forsake you. I'll never forsake you. Friend, no matter how dark it is or how dangerous life may get, God cares about you. God cares about you. And God's not going to forsake you and God's not going to abandon you. God is always with us. God's not forgotten about your family. You know how I know about that? Because, because you live there. You are a part of it, aren't you? God's not forgotten about your neighborhood. I know that because you live there. God's not forgotten about your job because you work there. God's not forgotten about this church because you and I are here and God's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We understand that God was with Joseph in the palace. 
We understand that, that God was with Joseph when he was favored by his father. But the same God that was with him during the good times is the same God and he was just as real in the pit and just as real in the prison. He's not only the God of the mountain, he really is the God of the valley. He's not only God of the day, he's still God of the night. That gets me excited. It brings a lot of comfort in my heart. To know that God's not forgotten about me, that God hadn't written me off, that uh, the Bible says I am engraved in the palm of His hand through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And friend, you are never forsaken. You'll never be alone. I told you last Wednesday night that, uh, that from the very moment that you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that there has never been a day in your life when you've been alone. Never. God has always been with you. God makes house calls. God makes hospital visits. God makes jailhouse visits. He, he walks through courtrooms. He'll walk through counselor's offices. He'll walk through the deep weeping places. He knows where funeral homes are. He knows where cemeteries are. The Bible says he's got every Jupiter tree named. And if that be the case, he's got a GPS on you and me as well. He knows where you are. He knows when you're discouraged. He knows when you're disappointed. He stands in the low valleys. He stands on the mountain. More importantly, he stands on the bow of the ship of Zion, and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In spite of his trials, in spite of his troubles, Joseph's faith brought him joy because of God's unlimited presence. It didn't matter where life took Joseph. Joseph found joy because he found God, because he found God, knowing him, his experience, and his unlimited presence presence. God is everywhere. Not only that, Joseph experienced God's unexplainable providence. There is a doctrine in the Bible that you just cannot get around, and that is the sovereign providence of God. God does not operate by a rabbit's foot. Isn't that silly to place your faith in a rabbit's foot on a keychain? Well, Grandma said it would work. Well, well, it didn't help the rabbit out, did it? It didn't help the rabbit out. I think because of a lot of people's stupidity, there's a lot of three-footed rabbits running around. I grew up with some good old boys that wouldn't go hunting unless they had their lucky penny in their pocket, stuff like that. And uh, some of you maybe have a four-leaf clover somewhere that you found because you think it's going to bring you some good luck somewhere. I don't know that I believe in all that. Uh, I have read where former presidents' wives wouldn't let their husband make a trip unless they consulted with someone that could conjure up the spirits, the spirits of dead people. Man, if people want their prayers answered, don't go to the stars. Go to the bright morning star. Boy, we are to live by an unexplainable sovereignty and the power of God. God is still in control of our lives. He has not given up his throne. He's still there. I remember when I, when I was in Israel, on our way back from Israel, some of you will remember when we got to Tel Aviv to, uh, to fly back from Ben Gurion Airport to, to, uh, to, our, to this country. And we, had, we got pushed back four or five times. And we had like a nine-hour total delay. We spent the night there sleeping on the floor of Ben Gurion Airport. And I'll be real honest with you, I didn't have a very good attitude about that when I found out the reason. An airplane coming to get us supposedly hit a bird, and that caused him to take an emergency flight. And I'm thinking now, this is a 747, however big this plane is. If a bird slowed you down, you got problems. That was a bit, it was a, that was a dinosaur, okay? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we spent the night in Ben Gurion Airport. But you know, as I, I remember very plainly, as I sat there in that airport, I began reminiscing over my life, and I came to one conclusion that God is a very big God, and He's good to His people. And He's good to His people. Man, if I could have sat down as a, as a little boy, and written a letter to Jesus and said, Jesus, here's what I want my life to look like. I don't know that I could have planned anything equal to what God has placed in my life. I've had problems like you've had problems, and, but in spite of it, there's been a joy in my life because, because I know that I'm not operating by accident and I'm not on autopilot, that there is somebody who has his hands on the reins and, and he, does stand, uh, he does stand at the wheel and he is the sovereign God of this universe and he's got everything under his control. He's done right by me. And friend, he's done right by you. He's done right by you. He loves you and he's got your best interest in heart. And when you experience the unexplainable, friend, it's probably the providence of God. It's probably the providence of God. You know the story back to Joseph. Finally, one day, Joseph was promoted to governor of Egypt, second in command. 
Anybody in that part of the world who wanted bread had to come to Joseph. Had to come to him. One day, Jacob's rebellious boys went to the only place that they could get bread, Egypt. They didn't know what God was doing behind the scenes. Joseph walked out that day. The Bible says he saw his brothers and he had to go back to a back room and weep. Broke his heart. One day he said to them, finally, he let them know, I am Joseph. Can you imagine the fear that probably swelled up in those, boys, those brothers' hearts? And they said something like this, Joseph, have mercy on us. We know we've sinned. Boy, our wives and our children are going to starve. Please don't kill us. Joseph told his brothers, he said, you thought evil against me, but God meant that for good, to save much people, to, to, to keep much people alive. You know, if Joseph hadn't have been on the throne, then his deceitful sons would have starved to death. You know what that tells me? It tells me that it doesn't matter what the intentions of your enemies are in your life, uh, that God is always going to work behind the scenes to, to bring about good. And, and He puts pieces together for good. And our lives are in the hands of a sovereign God who knows the way and He knows exactly what He's doing. He is the architect of our lives. He is the planner, the ruler. He'll turn bad situations into good because of unexplainable providence. Providence. An old preacher of long ago said this, if you'd walk up to the throne of Joseph and pull that chain off his neck and look on the reverse side of it, I believe you'd find Romans 8, 28 inscribed on it, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah for the unseen hand of God in our lives. Joseph experienced God's unfailing promises. You know, God said that one day the deliverer was going to come and he'd get his people out of Egypt, didn't he? How's that going to happen? Jacob and his sons who made up Israel had moved to Egypt and they're living under the rulership of Joseph. If you'll go back to our text in Hebrews 11, notice verse 22 once again. It says, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Here's what he said to his sons. He said, look, don't forget the prophecy that God made to our fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Papa Jacob. We're not going to be in Egypt forever. And let me interject this here to you, child of God. Don't forget the promises of God that God has made to you and that God has made uh, to me. Uh, God's going to get us out of this mess. We won't be here forever. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. Well, Joseph said this. He said, when that deliverer comes, I want to be part of it. Joseph said, you know what? I may be dead and in my grave, and there may be nothing left to me but my bones. He said, but when you leave, make sure you take me with you. Get my bones out of Egypt. And so Joseph did. Uh, notice, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 50, 26, the Bible says, so Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, we think uh, of a casket as, as something that we put dead people in, but, you know, jewelry shops, they also call expensive rings, the boxes that they go in, they call it a casket. It's a place that holds fine jewelry. Uh, the word coffin, as used in our scripture, means treasure chest, means hope chest. Uh, these chests are things that would hold precious jewels and things like that, things that would one day be retrieved for a special time, a special moment. Uh, we live in a modern age, but maybe some of you can remember hope chest. And, and in a hope chest, a lady would put things that they could use once they got married. They were special chests that would be filled with treasures for the future. And so they put Joseph's bones in a hope chest, if you will, a treasure chest, so that when, when, time, when that time came and they're getting out of Egypt, they could take his bones with them. All of us have put loved ones in caskets. We've all put loved ones in these hope chests, if you will, treasure chests. We've buried them in the ground. But we've got a promise from God that one day, one day we are getting out of here, that we're moving on, that God is going to come back. And when he does, you know what he's going to do? He's going to come back to his caskets, and he's going to remember his jewels. He's going to bring them out of the grave. Because there's going to be a wedding in the sky. And God promises that, 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 that there is hope beyond the grave because God's going to take His children out of here. This place is a temporary home for us. One day we'll be in our eternal home. The unfailing promise of God will get you through this temporary place. Friend, it's not forever. God's going to get us out of here. He's going to get us out of here. Well, you know the story. The blood was on the doorpost of Egypt. 
The death angel came through during the night. The next morning, half a million people lay dead. But there was Moses and his sister and brother and all the Israelites. They're marching out. They're marching out of Egypt under the cloud of God's glory. And on the box, in the box, on the shoulders of some of those Israelites were Joseph's bones. Someone said, don't forget Joseph. He didn't want to be left behind. He didn't want to stay in Egypt. He wanted to leave when we left. You know, when the trumpet sounds on the other side and the captain of our salvation says, come on home, come on home. You know what you'll be shouting? You'll be shouting, goodbye world. Hello, heavenly city. Hello. We don't know what for certain what tomorrow holds. Man, you could get a phone call that could change your life tonight. You could get one that could rock your world in the morning. You may not know what tomorrow holds, but thank God we can know who, tomorrow, who holds tomorrow. And that is the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Things will pass. This coronavirus era will pass. Thank God we'll look back over the seasons of life that hadn't been friendly to us. And we'll say, you know what? It was worth it all. It was worth it all. And when we leave this world of sin and sorrow, we'll wave goodbye to trials and troubles. We'll get to the other side. And I think we'll look at our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll say, Lord, you did all things well. You did all things well. Joseph, what a character. Perhaps the closest in the Bible to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we'll close our study there this evening in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 22, and we'll move forward, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet and be dismissed in a, a word of prayer this evening. All right, thank you for your attendance and thank you for your attention. Trust that uh, you'll have a good week, and we'll look forward to worshiping with all of you Sunday morning. Brother Gary, would you pray for us?